Hi, I'm Logan Medish, your host of the High Caliber History Podcast, and I appreciate you tuning in to this episode of the show. Today, we're going to be talking about some unconventional revolver designs over the past couple of centuries. Some you might have heard of, others you probably haven't. So I guarantee there's something in here that is going to be new to you, and you're going to learn something today. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. Revolvers have been around for the past few hundred years, give or take a few decades, depending on how exactly you choose to define the term revolver. Today's definition of what a revolver is has been established for more than a century, but that doesn't mean that there haven't been experiments with that design both before then and since then. So today we're going to take a look at 16 of the most interesting revolver designs from the past 150 or so years. First up, and again, these are in no particular order. First up is the Lamat revolver. The Lamat is probably the most well-known type of unconventional revolver. Invented by Jean-Alexandre Lamat, this handgun was patented in 1856 and saw some use during the Civil War by soldiers in the Confederacy. Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard helped fund the gun, and both he and General Jeb Stuart were known to have carried them. The gun got the nickname Grape Shot Revolver because the normal revolving cylinder, which held nine rounds of pistol ammo, did more than just revolve for each shot. In the center was a single, larger chamber, usually measuring the equivalent of a 20-gauge shotgun in diameter, that had its own shorter barrel mounted under the pistol barrel. Essentially, this allowed the Lamat to operate as a standard revolver with a last-ditch effort of sorts in the form of a short, short, short barreled shotgun. The shotgun was discharged by flipping down a piece of the hammer that changed the angle of its strike, allowing it to ignite the shotgun percussion cap. The guns were made in the United States, England, France, and Belgium. Despite so many locations, fewer than 3,000 total were made. The design was certainly innovative, but it wasn't necessarily very practical. Next up is the Walch revolver. One way to increase the capacity of a revolver is to load it with superposed charges. That is, one stacked in front of the other, so that you have two rounds in each chamber. And that's the exact concept used by John Walch with the revolver that bears his name, patented in 1859. In order to fire this gun properly, you need two hammers and, on some models, two triggers. Either way, the hammers are designed to reach percussion caps mounted in slightly different locations on the cylinder. To fire the front shot, which you have to take care to always do first in order to avoid blowing up the gun, you cock, course, you cock the corresponding hammer, which, upon striking the percussion cap, channels the ignition on an angle allowing it to bypass the powder and ball at the back of the chamber. Once the front charge has been shot, the rear one can be safely discharged. And this is done like any other conventional percussion revolver, as the ignition channel is in direct alignment with the back of the cylinder. Next up, we're going to talk about a, a series of revolvers all in the same family, the pinfire revolvers. Dating to the 1830s, this concept is one of the earliest attempts to create self-contained metallic cartridges. The cartridges are easily recognizable because of the pin that sticks out horizontally from the edge at the base of the cartridge. That pin is mounted directly above a primer that is held internally in the cartridge case. When the hammer strikes the pin, it's driven down into the primer and the round is fired. An interesting aspect of this design is that the pin in the cartridge is the actual firing pin. That is to say that guns designed to fire them have hammers, but the rounds are the firing pins. There is no uh, external or internal firing pin on the gun itself. So without that specific type of cartridge, these guns cannot be fired. Initially, they were quite successful and the concept expanded from revolvers and made its way into shotguns and rifles, where big names like Purdy, Boss, and Rigby all made pinfire models. Time marches on, though, and with the advent of rimfire ammo in the 1850s, it led to the demise of the pinfire. 
Next up is yet another uh, category of revolvers, this time being the cup fire revolver. Rollin White invented and patented a concept of the board through cylinder, which is the design that we know today in regards to modern revolvers. He licensed the patent to Smith & Wesson, making them the only company that could legally produce and sell revolvers that fired ammunition loaded from the rear of the cylinder. As always, though, necessity is the mother of all invention, and so the cup fire system was designed to circumvent the white patent held by Smith & Wesson. The self-contained metallic cartridges had uh, projectiles that were seated flush into the cartridge cases, and the rear of the cartridge contained a primer that sat with the recess facing out like a cup. Essentially, picture it like a primer being inserted upside down from how you would normally seat one into a traditional center fire cartridge. The cartridges were loaded from the front of the cylinder with access to the primer from the rear, thereby skirting the white patent. Looking at the cylinder, one could argue that it is actually bored all the way through. Technically, this is correct. There is a hole all the way through the cylinder. However, the rear diameter is narrower than the front, preventing cartridges from being inserted in any direction but from the front. So, also technically, it isn't bored all the way through because it cannot be loaded from the rear of the cylinder. When the hammer fell, the firing pin made contact with the recessed primer and the gun fired. Spent cartridges were ejected by means of a frame-mounted rod that used a mechanism similar to the bolt-action concept. The handle is lifted up to unlock the ejector rod, and it's pushed forward to eject the spent casing. And then it's returned to its resting location and relocked before rotating the cylinder to the next chamber. All told, about 20,000 guns of this design were made, making it one of the most effective ways to skirt the Rollin White patent. Next up is yet again another genre or family of revolvers, these being teat fire revolvers. Invented by Daniel Moore, these cartridges came to a narrow taper at the back with a priming compound contained in the tapered teat. Moore also designed the revolver, which bore his name, that was designed specifically to fire the rounds that he had invented. Again, loaded from the front of the cylinder, a teat fire round was designed so that the teat protruded from a small diameter hole at the rear of the cylinder. Again, this prevented it from being loaded from the rear, and so it wasn't considered to be a bored through cylinder, and they were able to circumvent the patent. When the hammer fell and struck the teat, the compound ignited uh, and the gun fired. Essentially, this concept can be described as being similar to that of rim fire, except that the center is struck instead of the rim. Moving on, we have the Vaughn revolver. Patented in 1862 by a Pennsylvanian named Aaron Vaughn, his revolver enabled extra shots by utilizing as much available real estate in a cylinder combined with two barrels. In order to accomplish this, Vaughn's cylinders had chambers positioned in offset inner and outer rows. These lined up with offset barrels that were milled from a single block of steel. The gun had one trigger and it operated two hammers, which had different shaped faces to strike the differently located percussion caps. The outer row had an axial firing cones, which were struck by the right hammer with a square face and the inner row had oblique cones, which were struck by the left hammer with a slanted face. This design ensured that the hammers could not reach and ignite the wrong chambers. Loading this gun was as unique as the rest of its design. The traditional hinged loading lever, as found on virtually all cap and ball revolvers, is present, but there are two pins on the end, so that two chambers can be charged at once. Next up, uh, it's a family of revolvers, but it's a little different here. Uh, we're going to be discussing the Snyder, Gardner, Limburg & Phillips, Philip, and Orr revolvers. These five revolvers are being lumped together because all of them operate on the same essential principle. Each of them has two cylinders, one in front of the other, mounted in the frame at the same time. 
In addition to the patent models, at least one of each was made, and it's possible, but unlikely, that more of each one could exist. In 1862, C.E. Snyder patented a revolver that had two seven-shot cylinders designed to fire small-caliber rimfire cartridges. The cylinders were placed in the frame back-to-back, -back, and a long hammer fired the rounds in a forward cylinder. Then, the barrel hinge was opened, both cylinders were removed while still, under, uh, while still on the center pin, and were turned around so that the second cylinder would now face forward and could be fired. In 1865, G.H. Gardner patented a revolver with two percussion cylinders, the forward one containing five shots and the rear one containing six shots. Obviously, the forward cylinder fired first to avoid catastrophic failure. Even though the forward cylinder only held five shots, it still had six chambers. And that's because the sixth round in the rear cylinder needed to find its way out of the gun somehow. So the sixth hole acted as a barrel extension of sorts. In 1870, Charles Lindbergh and William Phillips patented a six-shot revolver with cylinders arranged back-to-back -back like the Snyder. It operated on the same principle as the Snyder, but the percussion cones could be removed to permit firing of self-contained metallic cartridges. In 1873, W.H. Phillip patented an exceptionally complicated revolver that could be used with two cylinders like the ones mentioned previously, but it had the added bonus of also being able to function with three cylinders. Though there are a total of 21 chambers, only 17 are actually capable of holding and firing cartridges. The front and rear cylinders each hold six rounds with one left open in the front to act as a barrel extension and one in the rear to hold the firing pin extension for the other two cylinders. The middle cylinder only holds five rounds with one reserved as a barrel extension and the other reserved for the firing pin extension. This works because the grooves on the cylinder interact with the pawl that determines which sequence the cylinders revolve to provide correct firing. Confused yet? Yeah, I am too. Uh, and it's probably why the concept didn't take off. And finally, in chronological order for this grouping, in 1874, W. Orr patented a revolver with two six-shot cylinders and one hammer with two faces of varying length and angle. The more forward of the two reaches over the rear cylinder and fires the front cylinder first. Then, the rear portion of the hammer has an adjustable screw in it to allow the user to lengthen or shorten the reach, thereby controlling the ability to fire the rear cylinder or not. Next up are called triple threats. These are 19th century arms that got their name from the fact that they are three weapons in one, brass knuckles, a dagger, and a revolver, triple threats. Operating almost exclusively as pinfire weapons, the main shape of this piece is that of brass knuckles. The finger, hold, uh, the finger hold for your index finger is also the trigger, which puts the gun in perfect firing position just by wearing it. When you've expended all the shots and your hand hurts from hitting someone, you can also deploy, uh, deploy the small dagger for some stabbing action. Next up is a family called Knuckle Dusters. The design known as the Knuckle Duster is named as such because it could be rotated on your finger and the butt of the piece could be used as a singular brass knuckle. The gun had no barrel and fired directly from the cylinder, adding to its ability to be concealed, but relegating it to close quarters only. They were available in 22, 32, and 41 calibers. The small and concealable design made it popular with women and travelers so that they could have something handy without, uh, when they were out on possibly dangerous roads. It was also a popular design with gamblers who might need some concealed backup when the other players found that fifth ace that they were hiding tucked away in their sleeve. Despite their small size, the all-metal guns were pretty well made and even featured scroll engraving on both sides of the frame, the top strap, and even the front of the cylinder, making the gun both practical and attractive as well. The most well-known versions of these guns were made by a man named James Reed, and he called them My Friend Knuckle Dusters. 
Reed also offered his gun with a barrel, uh, first a three inch model and then a one and three quarters inch model in 1875 and 1877 respectively. This gave the guns a bit more accuracy at a little more distance, but the carrier sacrificed some concealment ability due to the added length. All told, Reed made approximately 13,940 of the standard knuckle dusters and only about 1,160 of the barreled models. His gun is an odd little design, but sometimes the most interesting designs come in the smallest packages. Plus, you gotta hand it to him with that clever name. I'll admit that I've referred to my carry gun as my friend on at least one occasion, so it definitely fits. Next up is the Webley Fosbury Automatic Revolver. Yeah, you heard right, the Automatic Revolver. The zigzag grooves on this revolver's cylinder are the most iconic and visually distinct uh, part of the gun. It's also a functionally distinct part of the gun. Patented by William John Whiting in 1901, the grooves played an important role in the gun's operation. When the top half of the cylinder recoiled to the rear, the cylinder grooves were engaged by a stud on the frame. This engagement provided 30 degrees of rotation, and as the recoil spring pushed the revolver forward, the cylinder rotated another 30 degrees and placed a new cartridge in line with the firing pin. It was this motion that led to the gun being called an automatic revolver. While it had its advantages, it was definitely not without its drawbacks. The Webley Fosbury was expensive to manufacture and, in turn, expensive to purchase. When the gun was made available to the public in 1901, you could buy a C96 broom handle pistol for 10 shillings less than a Webley Fosbury automatic revolver. When the gun made its debut at the Bisley shooting ground, it was met with great fanfare and copious amounts of positive press. And in 1902, famed target shooter Walter Winnens fired 12 shots, which included a reload, in a two-inch group at 20 yards in only 20 seconds. The rapid reloading was accomplished through the use of an early speed loader. A couple years later, attendees at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904 also lauded the design. Unfortunately, commercial approval only goes so far, and a military contract is what really would have been necessary for the design to survive. Unfortunately, that never materialized and production of the Webley Fosbury ceased. Entire production was only about 4,200 guns, the majority of which were all chambered in 455 Webley and about 200 or so uh, quite rare guns chambered for 38 ACP. Next up is the Mateba Auto Revolver. Emilio Gassoni, the heir to an Italian food processing company, sought to improve the shortcomings of the Webley Fosbury. His design, which was patented in 1987 and took another decade to reach production, was similar but also very different from the Webley Fosbury. Visually, it had an interesting shape to the cylinder, an ambidextrous cylinder latch, an extended beaver tail, very distinctive grips, and a compensator. Oh, and it also fired from the six o'clock position instead of the 12 o'clock position, which gave the gun an exceptionally low bore axis. Operation was similar to the Webley Fosbury, though not exactly the same. The cylinder's large, slab-like fluting and lack of other features are directly linked to the way the gun locks up and how it cycles. Cylinder latches to lock the chamber in place are located on the face of the cylinder instead of the outside edge. This eliminated the notches on the outside of the cylinder and also prevented a drag line from forming, which is very common on all revolvers today. The first shot from this type of revolver is double action with subsequent shots being single action. While you can manually cock the hammer for the first shot, it's not necessary. Recoil moves the slide to the rear, cocking the hammer. The forward motion returning the gun to battery rotates the cylinder to the next loaded chamber and the gun is ready to fire. No cams, no studs, no zigzag grooves uh, are used at all to rotate the cylinder. Because of the gun's low bore axis, its substantial weight of approximately three pounds, and its recoil operation, it's actually a fairly pleasant revolver to shoot. 
Follow-up shots are easily placed on target with a great degree of accuracy. Unfortunately, this wasn't enough to keep the company in business. Yet Sony failed to learn from the Webley Fosbury's mistakes. He was forced to sell the Mateba to a German company in the early 2000s, and by 2005, that company ceased to exist altogether. All told, less than 2,000 of the auto revolvers were ever made. Next up is the Kiapa Rhino. It's no coincidence that the Mateba auto revolver and the Kiapa Rhino look similar. Emilio Gassoni worked on the Rhino using his idea for a six o'clock firing position on this new gun. Beyond that, the Mateba and the Rhino are completely different firearms, with the Rhino operating like a traditional single action, double action revolver. Despite being unconventional in appearance, the Rhino has developed a solid core group of shooters and collectors. This has encouraged the manufacturer to make the gun in a variety of calibers, barrel lengths, materials, and finishes. Um, as of recently, there are more than 90 different SKUs listed for the Rhino on the manufacturer's website. That's a lot of variation for this design. Now, even though the Rhino turned out to be far more successful than the Mateba, Yasoni wouldn't live to see it. He passed away in 2008 before the design fully came to fruition. So as we near our end, we're looking back and looking forward. We've seen that some of their inventors for these designs looked to designs, uh, other designs from the past to find their way into the future. You never know what exactly is going to work and what isn't, uh, until it's put into practice. The case in point being that Gasoni's Mateba didn't catch on, but his Rhino design did. With the benefit of hindsight, we can see that most of the revolvers here were doomed to fail, but that didn't deter their inventors from trying. In that same spirit, who knows what kind of new revolvers we might see in the next few decades. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the High Caliber History Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope some of these were totally new designs to you and that you learned something today. Please feel free to subscribe and share this with someone else you think might learn some new revolver types. And I'll see you right here on the next episode of the High Caliber History Podcast. <laughs>